today on The State of Us. Should baseball be saved? And if we're going to save it, how can it be saved? Welcome to the State of Us. I'm your host, Justin T. Weller, joined, of course, today by the one and only, the friendly redneck liberal and senior resident historian here at True Chat, Mr. Lance L. Jackson. Today, we're taking a look at a few different pieces. Uh, First, how popular is baseball, really? We're going to look at the trends in baseball and whether or not it is as popular or less popular than people might think. We're also going to talk about baseball is dying. The government should take it over. That's the statement by a guest essay in the New York Times. Uh, Kind of an interesting notion. At first glance, it sounds a bit preposterous. But why are we talking about it in the first place? Well, baseball has deep roots in American history, of which you're going to learn about some today if you don't already know. And with its horizon shaky at best, uh, there's a question about whether or not to save, quote unquote, America's pastime. We'll actually talk about is it America's pastime as well. So there's a lot to discuss, Lance, uh, and this is one that may be Lance's favorite show in all of the history. Uh, But before we dive into that, do we have a word of the day? We do. The word of the day is batting average. Oh. (laughs) A number expressing the average effectiveness of a baseball player's batting figured by dividing the number of safe hits by the number of times at bat minus the amount of walks one receives, because that doesn't count as an at-bat. Hmm. There you have so it. So you have a little bit of math. So will you will you have a good batting average today? I have I have a great batting average. You know, it's it's wonderful that baseball is a sport where people are in the Hall of Fame as hitters if they get on base, if they get a hit three out of ten times. They fail seven times out of ten. And that will put you in the elite group of the Hall of Fame of baseball. That's what makes it a, an amazing sport. You can do your job and hit the ball. And if, and if you make an out seven out of 10 times, you're still considered one of the best ever. Yet if you shoot a basketball, you know, or if Tom Brady only completed three out of 10 passes or LeBron James only made three out of 10 shots, they would say, oh, they're horrible. Ah. You know? But in baseball, <clears throat> because it's such a – wonderful team game that it, it doesn't need to be revamped and it's not dying. <laughs> oh boy. Do you go to a stadium? How many young kids do you see in a stadium? Tons of young kids in the stadium. It's not dying. So so the show's over. Uh, baseball is perfect the way it is. Don't mess with it. Don't Well, the problem is it. they're messing with it. Oh, okay. And I don't and I'm not sure that the the general audience understands the deep connections of the history of the United States, particularly the 20th century and the game of baseball, how it just influenced decisions, you know, across and and added to, I mean, the game of baseball just last week um, had the anniversary of Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier in baseball. And they have a Jackie Robinson day, you know, and, um, so, and how it just correlated with the whole segregation movement of allowing a a black man to play baseball with whites and how that led to people rethinking their values and their attitudes, you know, and that back during World War II, one way if you, you know, you tried to find out if someone was a spy or not, would you ask them questions about baseball? And one of the first things you did as an immigrant before the 1950s was learn about the baseball teams. Because if you if you were an immigrant and you knew about baseball, then you were automatically accepted into society because, well, you knew baseball. So a lot of history connected to the game as well. One of the things the opinion pieces points out, Lance, is that um, similar to how the middle class, you know, also would seek out the importance of attending uh, certain, you know, fine arts events. 
uh, is arguably similar how baseball was viewed. It was a, it was one of those things that middle class individuals did as an aspirational sort of activity, not necessarily always because they loved or fully understood what they were doing. But to your point, depending on what class of society you were in, it was a way to fit in and a way to be accepted. Um, so it definitely was more center stage, or I guess in this case, center field uh, for American life at one point. My, my great grandmother didn't care for baseball one way or the other. But every time there was a advertised ladies day in St. Louis, she would put on her best hat and a dress and she would get on the trolley and she would go downtown and go to the baseball game. And my culturally gr- relevant and my gra- great grandfather would say, why are you going? You don't even like baseball. She goes, well, they're having a day for the ladies and I'm a lady. So I'm going to go be seen at the baseball game, <laughs> and, you know, to the cultural yes. importance here. The significance of what it was. So let's talk about what it is. Attendance at games has declined steadily since 2008, and viewership figures are almost hilariously bleak. An ordinary national primetime MLB broadcast, such as ESPN's Sunday Night Baseball, attracts some 1.5 million pairs of eyes each week, which is to say it's roughly the number that are likely to be watching a heavily censored version of Goodfellas on a basic cable movie channel in the same time slot. Even the World Series attracts smaller audiences than the average Thursday night football broadcast, the dredges of the National Football League's weekly schedule. In 1975, the World Series had an average of 36 million viewers per game. In 2021, it barely attracted 12 million per game. So casual observers may assume that despite this lack of popularity, baseball is still somehow insanely valuable. This is an illusion, contends the author. Major League Baseball generated around $11 billion in revenue in 2019, but this figure does not accurately reflect the demand for its product. The astronomical salaries that continue to be enjoyed by the sports stars are a result not of the game's non-existent popularity, but of the economics of cable television providers, who bundle regional sports networks alongside dozens of other channels so that anyone with cable TV is buying baseball, whether he likes it or not. Mike Trout's $426 million contract is effectively being paid by millions of grandparents who just want to tune in to Anderson Cooper or Antiques Roadshow as that audience dies off and younger generations of cord cutters take their place, baseball's revenue will plummet. Okay, so I've got to address three things right here that <laughs> that, that don't exist because of other articles that we found. Oh, okay. Um, and that is the average age of a person watching a baseball game on television is 57 years old. So I'm not so sure that millions of grandparents who want to turn into Anderson Cooper Antiques Roadshow are the people that are paying for baseball. They're the ones that are watching because that's the average age of someone watching a baseball game is Mm. 57 years old. Mm. So I have, I'll I'll take offense at that. And then you talk about how they're not. Well, okay, nationally, yes, baseball is not being watched as much on a national stage. But according to the Nielsen ratings in 2019, 12 of the 29 U.S.-based Major League Baseball teams were the most popular primetime broadcast in their market. An additional seven teams ranked in the top three in primetime. On cable, 24 Major League teams out of 30 ranked first in their market in primetime. And MLB ranked first overall on cable in every Major League market in the United States except Miami. So people maybe aren't watching it nationally like football, but everybody's tuning into their local geographic team's game. So regional cable is all kinds of stuff. And I think it's because you have those games as as a historian and as a lover of baseball. I remember when the only games I could get on television was the Saturday night or Saturday game of the week, Saturday afternoon. And it had a huge following. Why? Because it's the only game you could get. Okay? But I also remember I only got to watch a few college football games. And it was Ohio State, Michigan, and USC, UCLA. That, those were the only college football games you saw before the bowl games. I used to get up early on Sunday morning and on cable watch the replay of the Notre Dame game condensed to an hour. Because nothing else was on. So obviously... Feast and famine, right? Supply and demand. Now there's tons of games on, 
So when you show one on Sunday night, who cares, right? And baseball games go on six, seven times a week. The NFL, one day, basically Sunday. Oh, but what's the NFL done? Now we have Sunday night, Monday night, Thursday night, Sunday afternoon. Sometimes we go Sunday morning, you know, when we go over to London. They're beginning to saturate the market. But even with that, regionally, baseball outdoes all of those things. And then the last piece, I agree. One of the problems that baseball has is they start their main games at 8 o'clock at night. And a baseball game is long. <laughs> right. Well, but, you know, don't even go there. God, don't even go to baseball. Well, I didn't game. say it's bad. You know, They're long relative baseball, to other popular baseball's sports. Baseball's not meant to be played by a clock and fit into a time frame. That's why you go to a baseball game. It's that leisure activity where it starts and you don't know when it's going to end. And that's the beauty of it. If you've got somewhere else to go, then don't go to a baseball game. That's the beauty of the sport is that it, it, it goes until the last out is made. And that's, that's what makes it fun. Don't try to fit it into a time frame. But as television has taken over, that becomes the thing. Well, we want to fit it in this time slot to sell this advertising. And so, therefore, they're making changes to the game. But I think one of the biggest is don't start your main events at little kids' bedtimes. Because then how do you bring in the younger viewer? Since baseball, unlike other types of sporting events, fits less neatly into time slots, if you started at eight, you know you're going to hit the primetime audience with all your marketing dollars. And if it's not over until midnight, who freaking cares? Because everybody's gone to bed anyway. So if you have to adjust your TV schedule in the wee hours of the morning, it doesn't matter. You know, the effect is, is null uh, on most people's viewing. However, if you started in the middle of the afternoon, you can't plug things into your primetime slots because you don't know if baseball is going to be over or not yet. And so from a TV regional market standpoint, they look at that as saying, so we're not going to get the ad revenue because it's in the middle of the afternoon and it may screw up our primetime schedule. So we can't promote that these shows are going to be on at eight or nine. And this all comes back to what I think is a centralized thing anyway. There's a great appeal in the fact that baseball is local, right? That's one of the statements that one of the New York Times articles makes. Not the opinion piece, but one on how popular is baseball, really. Uh, well, locally, it is popular. Nationally, it is not. And you might say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about that and also talk about what that means for its future and part of, I think, the challenge that it faces. It is an asset. It is also a liability. To find out why, keep it here on The State of Us, and we'll be right back. Baseball. So it is a sport that uh, I've been around and have played myself for a long time. However, I can tell you that over the past decade, my interaction with baseball has been nil at best um it's it's very unacquainted with most of it and other I, than and seeing I, and it I, in the and news. i like you anyway <laughs> that's a that's a I big still consider, statement i c- still consider mr. you Lance Jackson. i still consider you a friend <laughs> even though uh, uh, what you just said just cut to the 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 depths of my heart and and it's a hard thing to explain because it's not like it was ever a conscious choice um now, granted, I think our listeners should also know, I don't spend a lot of time watching any professional sport. True. Okay, so it's right. not like baseball got singled out as, <laughs> right. as the black sheep, you, but I love of, other professional sports. You've kind of cut sports out of your, Correct. your life in the last yes. 10 years or so. Um, now, that said, you know, if a group of students at the youth center wanted to get together to go play baseball, I would go do that. That wouldn't be a problem. So th- there's a distinction for me between... Uh, being an observer of the game, particularly at the professional level, um, and engaging in the game. Not to sidetrack on that, but I just want the audience to be aware that it's not like I'm hating on baseball specifically. It's just I don't watch hardly any televised sports, but um, I do watch some baseballs. And definitely. yet we still find many things that we can talk about. That's correct. You know, and it's because I would say that other than my old westerns, <laughs> I spend the majority of my TV time watching 
Yes. Athletics, watching sporting events. Yes. Of all kinds. And what we left off at the break before, and this one, Lance, I think is so important because to me, it it may be the thing that's getting overlooked, right? Um, I don't want to see baseball die. Uh, necessarily, you know, I, I, it's not like I have anything against it. I think that there is a value to it. I also think that there is a value, as Lance pointed out, especially in the day and age of fast turnaround time, all this stuff, to have cultural style events such as baseball uh, that do not necessarily have a set end time. You know, you are going understanding that you're giving the better part of your day to this activity. And that's, you know, probably your whole day, depending on when the game starts, um, your, your time to get there, maybe eat ahead of time, go to the game, uh, you know, and then when the game is over, you may also be doing something. So I think there is a value to that. The challenge we talked about local, um, it's popular in local TV markets. Well, the other issue there is that local TV markets uh, and national are struggling, right? And they will continue to struggle with the rise of streaming. So the question, um, while yes, we're going to talk about some of the potential answers, which some of them involve changing the game, right? Or adjusting how it's played. Some involve who should own it. Um, I think something that's not getting talked about as much is how is it being promoted and where is it available to consume? Um, Yes, you can get streaming subscriptions to baseball, uh, but I don't think that MLB is doing a very good job of marketing to and bringing the importance of baseball to young people and meeting them, getting it to them in a way that they can consume it. Um, And none of that has hardly anything to do with the game itself. It has everything to do with the strategy at which you're using to get people involved. It is sad that the percentage of black players in baseball has declined so heavily. You know, that is sad. And it is one of the reasons why young viewership is not as strong as it once was. Um, you know, young people like to see aspirational figures. And if you're if you don't have many black players in baseball, um, black young black men and women are less likely to watch it because there are less people to aspire to be like, you know, and it's not that they can't aspire to the other players. That's not what we're saying. Um, But it is odd because it is one of the few areas where with other sports, the opposite has happened uh, and diversity has increased. Well, just so you know, because you think I'm, you know, such a dinosaur when it comes to TV watching, I stream 90% 90% of my baseball games. Well, see, because <laughs> so you can I, see more of them that way, right? Well, yes. Well, I see the teams I want to see. Ah. That's how, because my so team- So you're nationalizing it. My team plays, does not have a local TV station that carries the team that I grew up um, following. So therefore, I stream, I buy MLB's package, and I can stream all the games. And I can tell you, when I started doing this about- six years ago, that I would just get my game. Well, now I can stream my game. I can also watch a recap of the game, um, which takes about an hour. And then I can also see the highlights of the game, which takes two to three minutes. And every game is on the board. So if I hear something happened last night in a game that I didn't watch, I can go and I can watch the recap on my streaming and get all the highlights, see the greatest catch, the home, the key home run or whatever. So you and think this is a good invention so if there's by MLB? 15, well, what I'm saying is to your point, marketing it to Gen Z, you can watch the entire 15 games of Major League Baseball and catch all the highlights and see all the stars in less than an hour every day through the streaming package. You can just go and watch the recap of each game. And in a half an hour, you've seen all the biggest plays. You've seen everything that would be that sports center would pick the highlights from, and you can just watch it with, with baseball. Baseball's also signed something with Peacock where they're going to stream a certain number of games. So baseball is in the process of trying to bring that part of things into it so that, it can nationalize. I And I don't watch the national game. And as they said here, it's tough for me after rooting for my team all year for me then to get excited about 
watching a World Series among teams that I haven't seen. So, right. you know, that's the downside. Whereas before, I would listen on the radio. I know, archaic, right? Listen to the radio to my team's games. And just because I wanted to watch baseball, I would watch the Saturday afternoon game of the week. And then when the World Series came on, we all watched it because it was a chance to watch baseball. But by the time the World Series is played, I've already watched 170 baseball games. And so it's like, well, do I really want to watch these teams that just beat my team, you know, to, to win? And and I do because I'm a baseball fan, but I, I understand that argument. And then the fact that it doesn't start till 830 and it's not over till midnight. I don't want to stay up till midnight and go to work the next day to watch teams that I don't even have a rooting interest in. I mean, even the Super Bowl starts at six o'clock so that they can get it over so people can go to work the next day. Mm-hmm. And I think I think that's where baseball is making its mistake. But again, what's driving the eight o'clock start on national TV? Well, the ad dollars. Right. I mean, that's the other side of this is, and I'm not unknown to this, money's driving the sports world. Sure. Well, it is and, a professional business sport. But when TV gets involved, which allows the fan to see more games, then we have to do what TV says. Ironically, you could argue that MLB should exert a greater control over its sport uh, by taking more of its content to streaming. Um, And I might even contend that you lessen or remove the subscription fee for a large host of games because they could up the ad revenue of their own, especially if you're doing, you know, which makes a lot of sense, the highlights or recaps. Um, those are obviously available afterwards, and there's no reason that you can't and wouldn't plug in advertising into those, which is on demand and would give advertisers a greater control over who they're targeting. For example, if MLB learns that the people most likely to watch, you know, instead of watching the full game, you get the under 30s and they're interested in watching that one hour recap, right? Well, great. But now as an advertiser, I can pay to target those people with a different product that I'm paying. If I'm just broadcasting to a local network, I have the demo, but I'm also advertising to a lot of people who are never going to buy my product anyway, because they're not the right people to buy it. So there's, I think, an advantage to advertisers to go to that model. There's an advantage to the MLB to go to that model. The people that it screws are TV stations, which uh, that's a whole other conversation. But if we're being honest are on the outs anyway, you know, local TV stations, some of them are doing a good job of transitioning to digital. Many of them are not. Um, and many of them continue to die and will continue to die, uh, until they, you know, until and unless we transition and arguably the greater point in all this from my standpoint is that the thing that digital has not yet fully realized or figured out is how to maintain local in a digital age. I watch a team from another state. This is my favorite baseball team. But when it goes to commercial break, I get commercials while I'm streaming. My commercials are of the Senate race here in Ohio. They're customized. Right. Because they know you're in Ohio. Because I know. So even though I'm watching a team from another state, my commercials are given to me by so, businesses and issues in the state of Ohio. They're actually Because relevant. that's where I'm streaming. <laughs> right. So they are trying to to make those ad dollars meet the demand of the audience because somebody else could be watching the same team I am, but they live in Utah and those commercials, even though they're watching the same game I am, they get a different set of commercials exactly because they're selling the advertising dollars to the number of people that are watching my favorite team in Utah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, because what good would it do to show Lance the ad from the, you know, candidates for Senate in Missouri? Well, that'd be kind of silly. Well, it's kind of cool. I mean, I mean, when, but, is, but that's but, but that's a change in the last five years. Sure. Because I used to watch a game, mm-hmm. and I would get the local teams' commercials, sure. Whatever. which I found interesting. You know, it, it was culturally right eye opening. But from a but business standpoint, I don't want to pay. That, I don't want to pay if I'm a Senate candidate. I don't want to pay for Lance to see my ad because he can't vote for me. And to your point about the the essay here that where the government should take over, they make the point. That if the government took over, salaries would be lower and watching games on television or via online, streaming would be much simpler as broadcasts would be carried exclusively by C-SPAN. 
So I mean, they're, they're you could you could eliminate most exactly. commercials altogether, right. then, Lance. <laughs> Nationalize. That is the title of that article. That's what we're going to talk about here at the end. Uh, is we've talked a lot about that the state of baseball and some of the things that could be done, regardless of whether or not you're going to adjust the game or who owns it. But let's talk about this final one. Baseball is dying. The government should take it over. Always got to love when Big Brother comes in to save the day. Let's talk about what that would look like. Keep it here on The State of Us, and we'll be right back. The great game of baseball, Lance doesn't want too much to happen to it. Although he has readily admitted that the innovation of streaming via MLB is just a fantastic addition to the world of and baseball. I, but I understand the pitfalls. But I think the the thing we haven't really discussed besides this takeover is that baseball doesn't have to be number one. Baseball's dying because football's past it. See, I think that's a misnomer. It's like, well, since baseball is not number one, it's dying. And my my argument is, no, I think it's okay. Leave the game alone. It's okay if it's not number one. You'd rather see it relegated than distorted. Which is why I'm 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 not necessarily a purist per se, but some of the I don't think we need to drastically change the game to get the younger viewer because I think we have it. It's just not as high as it used to be. Well, and I'm okay with that. And if you still play a full game, but there's really an hour of, you know, the best content, if you're watching a recap, then arguably you already have this solution to that anyway. Well, they talk about how long a game takes to play. Okay. But when you have, you've sold two and a half minutes of advertising that has to be shown between every half inning, you just added 45 minutes to the length of the game. I mean, Historically speaking, baseball players used to leave their gloves on the field. They would just toss their glove down and run into the dugout. Pitcher would get seven pitches to warm up. First batter, boom, they play. Games were under two hours. Well, now they're complaining that games are three, three and a half hours. Well, every game that's televised, which is all of them, has almost an hour of commercial time sold. You do away with the commercials, you can shorten game times by 30 to 45 minutes. Never mind that the sport would go bankrupt, but... <laughs> well, but then you'd have to go to the... Well, then you'd listen on the radio or you would go you uh-huh. know, in person. Salaries wouldn't be as high, you know, but but understand the length of the Sounds game... Sounds like nationalizing baseball. Yeah, but the length of the <laughs> game is determined by television, not by changing the rules, but is, is my argument. Well, we've talked about that for years. You know, a football game is not a three-hour game. Have um, you been to a professional football game in the last 10 years? Yeah, it's probably it was probably about ten years. Isn't ago. Isn't it amazing how scripted? Oh yeah, a game is. It's it's astonishing. It's like, I mean, you don't really realize your it when you're gets, watching. Your team TV. gets a turnover. You know, you're sitting in the stands. Yeah. Your team gets a turnover. Everybody screams. Yeah, here we go. Rah! And then it's a four minute break while we have all the commercials. And in the stands, you're twiddling your thumbs. You're waiting for it. I mean, and you can even see it. The players on the sideline, they don't jump up and down and get excited because they know they got three or four minutes before they have to go out there and. Switch sides. I've not been to a lot, you know, but the last one that I was at, part of the reason I distinctly remember it was it was in Paul Brown Stadium. It was decent seats. You know, we were watching the Bengals and uh, and it was very strange experience, you know, because of that. Because when you do watch on TV, you don't really think about it because you do think there's stuff happening during the commercials. But in the stadium, it's kind of like, you know, <laughs> it's very weird because, you know, the camera cuts away and you don't see anything. And the players are now just kind of like, well, you know, milling around go to the sideline, whatever. It's like, why are we stopping again? What's what's taking place? Because if you're somebody that ever played baseball or has been to high school football games, you know, it's like that's not how that works. Like <laughs> we're on to the next thing, on to the next thing. The power you know? of television and the commercialization uh, of it yes. has totally changed the way it's played at the professional level. Sure. But arguably you wouldn't be televising it, carrying it if you didn't do that, because if there wasn't a way for people to make money off of it, they wouldn't be showing it unless Lance. So that's why the government takes over and we can all watch it on C-SPAN. That's the contention, right? Because you want to you want to get rid of the commercials. Well, we can do that uh, if we're all willing to pay for it. Uh as a culturally relevant thing, you might say, well, that's ludicrous, right? Well, think about parks. I mean, 
You know, that's not parks are an older notion, but they were not always a notion in this country. Um, you know, our founding fathers, generally speaking, national parks weren't a thing. You know, well, I don't know national parks. Uh, that Thank was, you to Theodore Roosevelt. Right. You know, I mean, more than 120 years ago. But we existed before that, right? And yep. we didn't pay for national parks. Right. Um, and we didn't have a lot of museums. And the museums that we did have usually were privately owned entities, not publicly owned. Um, so, I mean, things like the Smithsonian, which we all are like, well, yeah, that's part of America. You know, I mean, you go to D.C. and you see the Smithsonian's and nobody's like, oh, you know, the Smithsonian's, we shouldn't pay for that. That's stupid. You know, I mean, I'm sure there are people that do that, but I think most Americans don't think twice about it. Now, obviously, scale and scope, baseball would be a hell of a lot more expensive to operate than the Smithsonian's probably are. But Nevertheless, there are ways that it could be cheaper as well. That's true. And, but, you know, here's where I come in. Come in. I, I do a lot of traveling before COVID and I went to historical sites, believe it or not, you know, as a history teacher. And they're not very well funded by the government, which is why I'm not too keen on this idea of having the government take over baseball because many of the parks and historical sites that I visited that are run by the National Park Service are wholly underfunded. They they do not get the money they need. When you talk to the rangers that work there, they're woefully underpaid. And they talk about all the things they'd like to do if they'd get the money from the government to do them. And when we talk about that, well, let's say, where does the government get its money? Well, that's the tax base. And we Americans don't want to pay the taxes for a variety of reasons. So, but we have a lot of historical sites that are being run down. I've, I've talked to, you know, every summer I talk to the park personnel and they say, we can't keep up with basic maintenance. And so things are falling apart. In my visits, the government doesn't do a very good job of running those museums and historical sites. So I would hate to get to see them get a hold of the national pastime. <laughs> then what would happen? Yeah, I mean, I think, I guess my feeling is the the first thing, right, is to try some of what Lance and I've already talked about. And, and MLB's doing some of it. It has more to do with, are you really capitalizing on it? Are you really targeting the young listeners? One of these articles points out, Lance, you know, MLB set aside $10 million to invest in, you know, youth activities around the country. And it's like, are you kidding me? $10 million? I mean, I would love $10 million. I could do a lot of good right here locally with $10 million, but $10 million sp spread across the 50 United States and all the municipalities that baseball plays in? Are you kidding? I mean, that's a drop in the bucket, you know? If you're serious about getting young people involved in baseball, that's not very serious. That's a token gesture of keeping the people that already watch baseball believing that you care about it, even though in reality you don't. And I think that's one of those cases, Lance, where that to me is one of the single biggest things you do. You start those programs in the inner cities, you start those programs in rural America, and you really fund them aggressively and you build fans for life who guess what? Then they want their kids to do the same thing, right? So it is a long-term investment, which is a tough thing because, as we know, you would think that some of the most successful organizations on the face of the earth, like Major League Baseball, uh, would appreciate the value of a long-term investment. But there's also that we, yeah, but we could make a lot of money right now, you know. And frankly, a lot of the people that run the MLB, they're not going to be around for that long-term investment future. So they don't really give a damn, you know, I mean, it's, they're going to make their money. Baseball is going to be around as long as they're alive. So who freaking cares? But if you want to make sure the sport survives, then I think there's, uh, there's some necessary steps that have to be taken. Well, I agree with you. And it's, it's also, you know, this, the RBI, what you were referring to is the RBI program, you know, um, baseball in the inner cities and to, to get the, um, underprivileged youth to want to play baseball like they did in the past uh, instead of going to football or, or basketball. Um, but still it's, it's sad, I guess that attendance, but it's, it's okay. I mean, don't change your game <laughs> to get more people to watch. You should advertise, and this is my feeling, you should advertise the beauty and the good things about your game, not change your game to meet the demands of the younger generations. Sell your game to the younger generations. If the game has run its course and nobody's interested in it and you can't sell the beauty of it, then maybe it should die. 
I think it does deserve to exist. I think there's a lot of beauty to the game that's not promoted by Major League Baseball. And therein is why it's falling down is because they're trying quick fixes, to your point. We're going to have a pitch clock. We're going to have the DH. We're going to do away with the defensive stuff. We're going to juice up the baseballs so there's more home runs. We're going to, you know, turn our eyes and let the players take steroids. Yes, I'm talking about back in the 80s and 90s. Because that that way they'll hit more home runs and then we'll get more people to watch and we'll make more money. Let's go back and sell the game for what it was historically and what it is today. And then people will come watch it or they won't. Let it live or die on its own merit well, I think you exhaust all other methods first, right? I mean, that's the other thing that's kind of discouraging is it's like, well, have we really exhausted the investment in youth? Have we really given time for any of that to play out? Have we really exhausted everything we can do with streaming? I don't think they have. I mean, I think we've proven on this show there's more that could be done. They're doing some of it, but there's more that could be done. Um, and interesting that Lance mentioned the the saddle making because there are still saddle makers. Now, are there as many saddle makers as there were 150 years ago? No, of course not. But do people still ride horses? Are there still saddles? Uh, yep. yep. There are. There are still people that, you know, that they put their saddle on every morning and go to work. That is right. So, you know, I mean, I think that's the other side of that too, is baseball didn't start as major league baseball. You know, that's not what baseball was when it began. So, oh, wow. Did you just open up a can of worms there? Because nobody knows how baseball really started. So my point, is, the other point of that is, is it is it really dying if Major League Baseball regresses? I don't know. We'll leave people to think about that. Is that is that really the worst thing? Because are, maybe some of the problems that have been encountered were with the commercialization of the sport in the first place, which is something that we've talked about on this show before. One of the reasons that I don't watch a lot of professional sports is for that reason, because the sports, none of them started, you know, with the sole and express intent of becoming multi-billion dollar industries that control the mind of a nation. They started because people wanted to have some fun. Well, they actually started because the president said we were becoming, we were out of shape and needed to get some exercise. That's right. I mean, we had the book on that, right? A strenuous life. Yep. So it was about getting people active um, and bringing Americans um, an appreciation for the the activity of life, right? Getting out and doing things, physically exerting yourself. Um, so, but again, how many people know that? So it wasn't even started to make money. It was started to keep people healthy. Interesting. So why do we have this conversation today, Lance? Well, because here at True Chat, we have a mission. And our mission is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. And when you're Around the water cooler talking about the game from last night and that great play that was made and the home run that was hit to win the game. Well, you can tell people, well, you know, you can listen to that kind of stuff on the state of us. They go, oh, where do we find that? You say, well, there are podcasts on Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and everywhere podcasts are found. The state of us is available every Tuesday and Thursday as a podcast. We're also heard on the weekends, the old fashioned way on AM and FM radio stations across the country. For the State of Us on True Chat in Urbana, Ohio, I'm Justin T. Weller. I'm Lance Jackson. Special thanks to Bradley Butch, our producer, and thank you all, our audience, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the change. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in thestateofus.org.